Do you like monks? How about rangers? How about beekeeping, honeymead making ranger monks? More importantly, do you like grating cheese? <laughs> because if so, you're gonna enjoy today's build. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into character builds for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build something with the hopes of creating a character that is both really fun but also really powerful to play in-game. So, if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you are thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby. I put out these build videos every Tuesday. So if you enjoy what you see, I would appreciate it if you would uh, consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there that says join. You click on it, it'll tell you about all of the wonderful, amazing things that you can get uh, by being a channel member, like getting access to the write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate the build yourself without having to go back and rewatch uh, the video, or getting access to the member Discord server, or even getting access to the uh, monthly Q&A live hangout sessions that we do for Platinum members. Anyways, it's a great way to support the channel. Thank you, humongous shout out to my channel members. Could not do this without you guys. You're amazing. And everybody else, you are also amazing. Just watching and liking and subscribing and clicking the notification bell are also great ways to support the channel. So even if you don't want to be a member, doing any or all of those other things are also fantastic and I'm grateful for you. So last summer, I was going through the really fun Dungeon Dudes multi-classing series, right? Usually taking interesting or challenging to get them to work combos that Kelly and Monty would talk about and then trying to combine these two classes that they had discussed maybe in a fun and powerful way. At one point, when they were doing their monk multi-classing tier ranking video, they challenged me to do a monk ranger build, the result of which was the Flurry of Darkness video, which you can see right up there. However, when coming up with that build, I actually had a lot of back and forth with my good friend and bromance partner, uh, Kelly, about different ways to potentially take the combo. One way that I did not use, but that seemed super fun and intriguing, was to combine them in a way, and maybe actually with a third class even, that could result in a huge, massive 45-foot push off of a single attack. I remember Kelly seemed especially excited about the idea. I mean, what kinds of things could you do with all that forced movement? Think about all of the cliffs we could be launching people off of. Now, sure, these days, forced movement is fairly easy to come by in D&D, and that seems to be only like becoming more the case in one D&D, if the stuff that we've seen in playtest is any indication anyways. And I, for one, love that. There is just something to be said for doing stuff as a martial character that involves more than just hitting stuff, right? Plus, it feels so cool to be forcibly moving enemies around the battlefield. Anyone who's watched Star Wars or like, any anime ever knows how cinematic and awesome that can feel. And with all of the ways that exist in game, and again, that are being added with 1D&D, for doing damage to enemies when you move them into or through something that a player can potentially create, usually in the form of a spell, it just adds a layer of tactical play and cooperative play that makes combat encounters a lot more fun, I think. As evidenced, I would argue, uh, with the one shot that uh, Chris, Pack Tactics, and Insight Check, and I did a couple of months ago, you can watch it up there if you haven't seen it yet. It was a lot of fun. So anyways, needless to say, I loved the idea of a big pushy monk ranger too, but felt at the time that I was talking over this with Kelly, that I had done some kind of similar things in builds recently. I told Kelly, I'm gonna put this on my to-do list and get to it eventually, and today is the day that we finally build it. And I'm so excited because it's so awesome. Oh, and speaking of 1D&D, the new player's handbook is due out in September of this year, 2024, for those who are 
watching later. I cannot wait. I think uh, that this build gets better in some ways and maybe worse in others, at least one other, if we're using the existing announced changes that are coming anyways. So especially if you're watching this after that new rules update sometime in the fall of 2024 or later, stay tuned. And in the final thoughts, I will talk about how 1D&D changes things a bit for this build, um, though I know that regardless, it's still going to work great. Arguably, probably, I would say even better than ever. Oh, and also, just FYI, we're going to be building this character for sustained damage, DPR, damage per round. I think it will work well for burst damage too eventually, but not until like level 10 or so. It doesn't make a lot of sense to call it a Nova build if there's no real Nova option until the point at which most of us are ending our campaigns, right? Okay. Let's jump into D&D build number 160. The pushy munger, monk ranger, the cheese grater ronk, ranger, monk. Wait, duh, the cheese munger, monger, the cheese monger, right? It's perfect, it probably doesn't get enough clicks as a thumbnail. How about the open swarm? The palm in the swarm, that's clever. In the end, I think I'm gonna have to go with the flurry of throws. Thanks to everyone on the Discord server for the suggestions, and especially to Logan, log, parentheses, N, Logan, uh, for my favorite suggestion there that uh, we're gonna be using for the title. Also, big thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the artwork that he put together for this build. I love what he does. This is a great one. He actually ended up doing two pieces for the build this week because originally I told him that I was going with one race, and then I changed my mind and told him that I was going to do another. Both of them are fantastic, as you can see. And I'm going to let you guys guess which one we're actually going to be going with. Um, yes, if you'd like to follow Randall, I'll put links on how to do so in the video description, as always. Reach out to him. See if you can commission him to create some art for you or your entire party, maybe. And before we jump into the build, I want to talk to you guys, remind some of you about World Anvil, the sponsor for the video this week, and also a company whose services many that play at my table take advantage of me included. World Anvil is basically the greatest software out there, both for GMs to build their homebrew world and for players to interact seamlessly with that world. For you world builders, you game masters, World Anvil supports over 45 game systems, including D&D and Pathfinder, but dozens more besides. It will even help you to integrate your own gaming system to work with their software. With World Anvil, it is super easy to create wiki-style presentations of your world and your writing so that you can keep track of everything you build. They also have an awesome interactive map builder that you can customize to the nines, and even chronicles that combine timelines with those maps so that you can plot and keep track of what happened, where, and when in your world, whether like before your campaign started or while your campaign has been going on, right? Presenting information to your players has never been easier. And yes, players, World Anvil is for you too. It not only makes it easier than ever to access everything that your GM wants you to know about their world and their campaign, but you can even build your character right from within World Anvil's site, regardless of the setting that your game is taking place in. You can keep track of hit points, spell slots, and inventory, sure, but it even has the best system for like backstory creation, journal entries, and session note taking that I've ever seen. World Anvil does it all. So please do yourself a favor and go check them out. You will not regret it. Sign up for a free account, if nothing else, to see what you might be missing. When you do, I would appreciate it if you would use this URL here so that they know I sent you. I'll put a link in the video description as well, of course. And if you decide to purchase a premium subscription, use the code D4 at checkout to save an insane 51% off of the subscription price. Like over half, that's nuts, right? Stop losing money on this deal and just go sign up. Right, huge thanks to World Anvil. You guys are awesome and let's jump into the build. All right, at level one for our starting class, I think I wanna start off here as a ranger. The main reason is because with all of the pushing that we are going to be doing, we really want a good spell that will actually do something for us when we push an enemy into or through it, right? And most of you can probably guess where I'm going with this, but yeah, Ranger will get us that spell. So let's beeline for it just as soon as possible. As for our race, I'm gonna say let's go Mountain Dwarf. Not a half elf as I had originally planned. And yeah, I think Mountain Dwarf is, I think that's two weeks in a row, right? I love Mountain Dwarfs. You don't have to go this route if you don't love Mountain Dwarfs. Feel free to play a half elf, which would be a solid choice still, I think. Or of course, a variant human, custom lineage for a free feat, or honestly, just about any race would work well here since you can always at least get three plus ones, but I do think Mountain Dwarf edges them all out mechanically if 
ever so slightly. Because mountain dwarves, famously, get a plus two to two ability scores, right? And yes, since Tasha's, they get to choose where to put those bonuses, right? Not, they don't have to be in strength and constitution, unless your DM says they have to be. Um, but this is gonna let us start with a 17 in our two most important stats. And we really want a high dexterity and a high wisdom. So assuming point by as always, I'm gonna say for abilities, let's take a 15 dexterity plus two, a 15 wisdom plus two, and then a 14 constitution. And that's going to be really, really nice for us having two 17s when we hit level four, right? As for equipment, we don't need anything other than what's offered to us with standard equipment. So yeah, grab some scale mail armor for now, a couple of short swords, and whatever else you think you might need. At Ranger 1, then, we get the Deft Explorer Canny feature, uh, which basically just gives us expertise in one skill, right? Letting us double our proficiency bonus for a skill that we are proficient in. And I think I'd probably take Perception here here, as it's probably the most oft called for skill check, but feel free to go with stealth if you want to be a party scout, or even persuasion or something if you want to try to be a party face, though with your eight charisma you're not going to be a very awesome face, but uh, I mean hey, at least this could potentially keep you from being terrible, and it will scale, so... Anyways, we also at Ranger 1 get Favored Foe. This lets us, with our concentration and proficiency bonus times per day, mark an enemy so that we do an extra d4 of damage to them once per round when we hit them with an attack. Not something that we're going to use once we're concentrating on a spell, but better than nothing otherwise. At level two, we get a fighting style, and I think two weapon fighting is gonna be our best bet for now, as that will let us add our dexterity modifier to the short sword attack we make as a bonus action, which, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm gonna be doing here, at least for these first few levels, uh, two weapon fighting, right? So that we can make one short sword attack with our action, then another with our bonus action and the offhand, right? And thanks to this fighting style, we can add the dexterity modifier to that offhand attack. We're not usually able to do that, Right? And yeah, two attacks, both adding our uh, dexterity modifier to the damage. It's pretty decent damage as a level two character. We also get ranger spells here, and I would for sure grab Entangle, as it can be a decent little multi-target control spell, potentially restraining multiple enemies, which would give us advantage on attacks against them, and give them a disadvantage on their attacks, plus keep them from moving, right? Beyond that, Absorb Elements is a nice defensive option, uh, Cure Wounds, and of course Goodberry for some good healing options. Should we take Hunter's Mark? I mean, maybe? Probably? It's not a fantastic spell, but there are times when it's worth using. Namely, if you think you're going to be attacking the same target for two or three rounds before they go down, as it adds a d6 of damage to every weapon attack you make against an enemy, right, at the cost of both our bonus action to cast, and then after they die, transfer it to somebody else, and our concentration. So. Yeah, most of the time it's not going to be worth sacrificing your bonus action to do 1d6 more damage on a hit unless you're going to be hitting them for at least a couple of rounds. Or you could somehow get the spell off before combat started. I think I would learn it at least eventually because in a little bit we are going to be using it at least for a couple of levels I think. But arguably you might be better off with Favored Foe on most fights rather than this. Even though that's only a d4 and it only works on one hit per round. I know, I always badmouth favored foe, but hey, at least it doesn't cost a bonus action to use, or a spell slot, right? At level three, we get Primal Awareness, which at this level basically just lets us know the Speak With Animal spell and then cast it once per day without having to spend a spell slot. Some nice little utility. But then we get our Ranger Archetype, our Ranger subclass. And we, as I'm sure many of you have guessed, are going with one of my favorites, the Swarm Keeper. It really is one of my favorites, but I think I've only used it once in a build before, the Swarm Keeper Slingshot, which was a lot of fun. Uh, it did run into some problems mechanically uh, with the rules as they're written. Anyways, Swarm Keepers are absolutely perfect for what we need mechanically, but I also love the idea, the concepts of the Swarm Keeper, right? Because Swarm Keepers, first of all, get the Gathered Swarm feature, which tells us that a swarm of nature spirits has bonded itself to us to help us out in battle. And since we get to choose the appearance of our swarm, I'm totally going with bees. Because monks, as everybody knows, are famous for making honeyed mead. <laughs> Every time I say that, as everybody knows, I have to, like, quote Princess Pride. Because Iocane comes from Australia, as everyone knows, and Australia is entirely peopled with criminals. <laughs> Oh, it's such a good movie. Where was I? Because monks, as everybody knows, are famous for making honeyed mead. Okay, maybe that's just like Western Friar Tuck-esque monks and not so much the Asian-inspired monk that's arguably more 
closely aligned with what Wizards of the Coast is going for with their monks, but I don't care because my ranger monk is from a monastery that makes world-class mead, and as everyone knows, to make world-class mead, you need world-class beekeepers, and my character is totally a world-class beekeeper. They're so good, in fact that even the spirits of the bees are in love with them. And that is just cute and awesome. Feel free to make your spirits uh, birds or butterflies or pixies or something else if you want, but don't go like locusts or cockroaches because ugh, you're gonna trigger somebody at your table. Anyways, we're told that once on our turn, immediately after we hit a creature with an attack, we can have our swarm do one of the following. Do an extra d6 of damage, move us five feet horizontally in a direction of our choice, or best of all, and the main mechanical reason we wanted to be a swarm keeper, force the enemy we hit to make a strength save against our wisdom-based spell DC, or be moved 15 feet horizontally in a direction of our choice. And thus, we have our first forced movement ability that we are kind of building around here, right? The fact that we can move them in any horizontal direction here and not just away from us is especially nice, meaning that we could potentially make a ranged or thrown attack against an enemy and pull them towards us, for example, if we really needed to do that for some reason. It's also great that there's no size restriction on who this can impact like there so often is for force movement, yeah? Also, as a Swarm Keeper, we get Swarm Keeper magic. This just tells us that we learn the Mage Hand cantrip for free. Always nice, but our Mage Hand looks like a swarm of bees, which is way better than a regular Mage Hand, no question. We also get an extra spell for free with every spell level, and for us here, that means Fairy Fire, which is a nice spell, letting us debuff potentially multiple enemies so that attacks against them have advantage and keeping them from benefiting from invisibility. Did I say benefiting? I felt like I said benefiting. What did the subtitles think I said? Right, at level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and that means we get to take a plus one to dexterity and a plus one to wisdom so that we have an 18 in both, and that is just so awesome since we are going to get so much out of both of those stats. Hooray for Mountain Dwarves. Also, with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we got the optional feature martial versatility, and I don't talk about it all that often in my build, but I wanted to mention it here because I think we ought to use it to switch out fighting styles now, since this feature only lets us do that when we gain a level that gives us an ability score increase or feat in Ranger, right? So here, let's go ahead and switch from two-weapon fighting to dueling, letting us do an extra two damage when we are only wielding a single weapon in one hand. It's a teeny step backwards for us damage-wise, but it would let us, like, equip a shield for now to raise our armor class and potentially make use of Hunter's Mark, at least at this level, since if we're not two-weapon fighting, we don't need our bonus action as much and doing Doing, what 1d8 for our weapon if we grabbed a longsword or something right plus 2 plus 4 from our dexterity modifier plus a d6 for hunter's mark is almost as good as the 2d6 plus 8 that we were getting before right so yeah grab your favorite one-handed d8 weapon now whether that's a longsword or a warhammer or whatever and probably a shield to boot at level 5 we get extra attack so now we can make two attacks when we take the attack action very nice and then we get second level spells now Swarm Keepers get Web for free, which is similar to Entangle, but better. Amazing for control, super useful. And then, yeah, I'd want to grab Aid to both heal and increase maximum hit points of several party members. Pass Without Trace to help your entire party get a massive plus 10 to their stealth checks. Lesser Restoration is nice when you need it, but the most important spell for us, for this build, is, yes, Spike Growth. It's been a minute since I've done a build for Spike Growth, but man, is this spell rife with potential. Especially if you've got a team built around it, taking advantage of it. So yeah, like I like this build even more if someone else in your party is casting spike growth. I'd probably do it differently. I might start with monk. But if your team is not kind of built around taking advantage of spike growth, it can potentially be problematic. Let's discuss. You cast it as an action, requires our concentration, it lasts for up to 10 minutes, that's nice. It covers a 20 foot radius area with spikes and thorns. So that's like 40 feet end to end, right? Way bigger than in BG3, take a drink. Uh, that area becomes difficult terrain, and then importantly, when a creature moves into or within the area, it takes 2d4 piercing damage for every 5 feet that it travels. So, yes, going forward, our MO is basically going to be cast spike growth to make our enemies' lives miserable, and on subsequent turns, attack them and push them into and through spike growth with our swarm here doing extra damage to them when they fail their save against that forced movement. Pretty simple 
very effective. One thing to keep in mind though, kind of like I said, this spell, while great, can potentially be a pain for your allies to deal with if they're melee, for example, and they weren't really planning on having to deal with it, right? Maybe the only enemies left are stuck in the middle of your briar patch, and now your ally has to either wade through the brambles to attack those bad guys, taking damage for doing so, or like maybe get out a thrown or ranged weapon to attack with, and they weren't really built to do that very effectively, it can potentially sour their mood, especially if you're doing it all all the time, like we probably will be. So as always, please be sure to discuss your plans, not only with your DM, but with the other players at your table before you even begin playing this character so everyone is on board and maybe you can all find ways to synergize with the spell or at the very least help set expectations around what combat is going to look like for you and everyone else most of the time, right? Good. Uh, don't forget, also at this level, our Primal Awareness feature gives us the Beast Sense spell for free now, letting us kind of warg into a beast that we touch to be able to see and hear with their senses, which is a nice bit of utility when we can take advantage of it. But at level 6, now that we've got extra attack, one of our important forced movement features, and our all-important spike growth spell, I think it's time to start our multi-classing to pick up even more of said forced movement. So yes, that's going to mean monk levels first and foremost. So we would be a monk 1 here, and that's going to mean, first up, we get unarmored defense, which tells us that so long as we are unarmored and unshielded, our AC is equal to 10 plus both our dexterity and wisdom modifiers. So yeah, that's going to be a very small step backwards for us here. Assuming that we had like half plate by this point and we were using a shield, we were rocking a 19 AC, not bad. Now, if we doffed the armor and lost the shield, we'd be at an 18, uh, one less, right? That's not terrible. And going this route will do nice things for our damage because it's going to let us regain a weaponized bonus action. Unfortunately, until next level, we're actually going to have to go back to a D6 weapon because those D8 one-handers can't be monk weapons for us yet, anyways, as monk weapons are simple weapons and short swords. And we want to be using a monk weapon because doing so lets us take the best advantage of our martial arts feature, which we also get at Monk 1. This tells us that, again, so long as we are unarmored or unshielded, we can use dexterity instead of strength for unarmed strikes, use a d4 instead of just a flat 1 for our unarmed strikes, and make an unarmed strike as a bonus action when we take the attack action, so long as that attack was with a Monk weapon, right? Okay, at level 6, it is time for our first damage report. Let's talk about what combat looks like for us here. It's fairly straightforward. On round one, we're casting Spike Growth, trying to get as many enemies in the area of effect as we can, and this is gonna do nice things for our team, doing damage, slowing down enemies, it's a strong move. After that, though, we simply walk up to a target that's ideally like just on the edge of Spike Growth or even just inside of Spike Growth. We make two short sword attacks that deal 1d6 plus two for our fighting style, plus four for our dexterity, and then an unarmed strike bonus action for 1d4 plus 4. Then pushing them with our swarm on that last hit 15 feet into the spike growth for an extra 6d4 of damage. Now, in the past, when I've done builds like this, the uh, the Open Spores Monk and like the Sorlock Cheese Grater, I think that might be my last card. Anytime an enemy is left in the middle of spike growth, I always assume that they're going to take damage on their turn, like trying to get out. Of course, that won't always be the case. Maybe they have a teleport ability. Maybe they're a ranged enemy or or a spellcaster, right? But in order for me to kind of accurately compare apples to apples with my builds here, sure, I'll assume the same for this one and say that they've got to wade through 15 feet of thorns to get out taking some more damage. So all told, if everything lands and they fail their save, we would be doing 2d6 plus 7d4 plus 12 damage on our turn with them taking another 6d4 on theirs, right? And so against enemies with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their strength saving throw, we would on average do 46 damage per round. And against a 15 AC and a plus five, it would be 32 DPR. And I wanna make a quick note here of how I'm like calculating these things. For for ease of being able to read this on the spreadsheet, yes, in case you didn't know, when I'm targeting both armor class and saving throws, I just do like 
10 to 25 armor class and like plus zero to plus 15 strength save, right? And that's somewhat useful, I suppose. It keeps me from having to like do two tables, right? But the reality is a 10 armor class, you almost never see it super low. A plus zero to strength save, especially at this level, is not that uncommon. And strength saves very rarely get higher than like a plus 10. And usually they're much closer to like a you know, plus five, six, seven, something like that, even on strong monsters where weak ones are having, you know, low single digits, sometimes even negative. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these numbers, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is these numbers might be a little bit deflated because while a 15 armor class is fairly typical, maybe even slightly low for this level, a plus five to strength save at this level is pretty high, right? And so that's going to skew these numbers. Regardless, that's pretty solid damage. And yeah, we can do this damage pretty much every turn, in theory, at least, so long as we've got an enemy that's standing close to the edge of our spike growth. And yeah, admittedly, that's not going to be happening every single round. But as always, I'm calculating based on the best case scenario so that we can see the limits of what's possible. So compared to other sustained damage dealers that I've done to date at this level, this is kind of middle of tier two. Not bad, but it's going to get a whole lot better here. So stick with me. At level seven, we would be a monk two, and that means we get key. This tells us that we now get one key point per monk level. They reset on a short rest and they can be used at the moment for three things. Patient defense and step of the wind let us spend a key point to take the dodge or dash or disengage actions as bonus actions instead. Uh, this is getting a really nice upgrade in one D&D. And flurry of blows, our most important feature here. It says we can make two unarmed strikes instead of one as a bonus action if we spend a key point and take the attack action first. That gives us four attacks in a turn now, so long as we've got the key to spend on it, and that's fantastic. We also get unarmored movement. This says that so long as we are unarmored and unshielded, we get an extra 10 feet of move speed, which is really nice for the dwarves of the world, especially with their 25 feet move speed, right? Putting us up to a much better 35 feet now, which is especially useful for those of us needing to constantly get into just the right position to push people into our briar patch, right? Or maybe like push, then move, then push again, which we'll be able to do here in a minute, you know, whether on the same target or maybe on a different one. And now we're pushing a couple of people into the briar patch. Very nice. Don't forget the feature from Tasha's that we get at Monk 2, also dedicated weapon. This lets us basically pick a non-heavy, non-special weapon that we are proficient in and consider it a Monk weapon. So yay, now we can go back to our longsword or warhammer or whatever. Though we would still rather be using it one-handed as opposed to like two-handed since you know it's versatile but again since we've got the dueling fighting style we get plus two damage bonus if we use it one-handed and that's slightly better damage i mean sure we're just talking one more damage on average so if you would have rather back at level four picked up like blind fighting instead of dueling right i wouldn't blame you Right, at level eight, we would be a monk three, and that means we get our monk subclass, our monastic tradition, and we are going with, you guessed it, the way of the open hand. Now, let me actually mention that I think you could make the four elements monk work pretty well here as well, if you'd rather flavor your monk with some avatar-like qualities, and oh my gosh, that reminds me, tomorrow, the live action avatar show comes out, and I am cautiously optimistic. I know. It, it, you guys are watching this. It's already out. It might have really sucked. And I'm nervous. But I'm not that nervous because knowing myself, I always tend to like be an apologist for like things that I already really like. And I kind of put my rose colored glasses on and, and don't see the flaws. So I'm pretty sure that I'm going to like it. I hope I'm not wrong. Anyways. But it is a little tougher to pull off and it is also more resource intensive. Open Hand is my favorite monk subclass, conceptually at least, because I love the idea of uh, like my body is the only weapon I need Kung Fu Master, right? Mechanically, the main reason that we're here is for the Open Hand technique, which we get at this level. This tells us that whenever we hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by our flurry of blows, that whenever is important, then we can apply one of the following effects on the target. Make them succeed on a deck save or be knocked prone, keep them from taking reactions until the end of our next turn, or 
Best of all for us, of course, make them succeed on a strength save or be pushed 15 feet away from you. This has obvious great implications for us, but I think it might actually be better on this build than you're thinking. I know it took me a second to figure out just how good this could be. I'll discuss more uh, in the upcoming damage report. Don't forget, we get deflect missiles at this level as well, which lets us use our reaction when hit by a ranged weapon attack to reduce the damage and maybe even throw the missile back if we want to spend a key point. Here's another thing that is getting a fantastic upgrade in one D&D, at least as per the latest playtest anyways. At level 9, we would be a monk 4, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat. And to be honest, I'm a little torn on which stat to increase here. I mean, dexterity seems like the obvious choice, since it increases not only our armor class, as well as some really nice skills, our initiative, but our chance to hit and our damage bonus. But wisdom is super important, especially on this build. Build. Right now, mostly because it both increases our armor class too, sure, but better yet, increases our chance to push our enemy, as both our swarm keeper push and our open hand push get to be saved against, and that save is based on our wisdom modifier, right? And a lot of our damage is coming from those pushes, almost half. But yeah, for now anyways, we get just a teeny bit more damage on average by bumping dexterity to 20 here if you crunch the numbers. I mean, I'm talking one to three points on average, but of course that's going to depend on their armor class and also their strength saving throw bonus. So whether you take dex or wisdom here, you're correct. I'll assume dexterity because the spreadsheet likes it a little bit more. We also get slow fall uh, at this level. So yeah, that's just, you know, we use our reaction to reduce falling damage to ourselves by five times our monk level. So fun. Go clear cliff diving. Okay, at level 9, it is time for our next damage report. And we are going to be in a much better place now than we were since last check, so let's get into the details of why. Once we've got spike growth down, we run up to our target, ideally someone standing very near the edge of spike growth as always, and attack them twice with our D8 weapon, then we flurry of blows. Now, on the first unarmed strike, we push them 15 feet away from us into the spike growth, and then with that same attack, we pull them back towards us thanks to gathered swarm. Say what? Can you do that? Yeah. You can, or at least rules as written you can. Let's get dirty. <laughs> Do not take that statement out of context. Don't want to see memes of me popping up inviting people to get dirty. Both open hand technique and gathered swarm tell us that we can move the enemy with the attack if they fail their save. Open hand specifies that it has to be away from us, but gathered swarm, as we've talked about, says that it can be in any horizontal direction of our choice. And there's no reason that both can't be applied to the same attack. And there's also no reason that, say, the gathered swarm movement has to come before for the open hand technique movement. In fact, in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, we get this fun little tidbit about simultaneous effects. Quote, if two or more things happen at the same time, like say two forms of forced movement, right? The person who controls that creature, that's us forcing the movement, decides the order in which those things happen. Now, your DM, of course, may decide to step in and say, no, I'm going to decide that gathered swarm movement comes first or that the gathered swarm movement has to be in the same direction as the open hand technique push, even though the rules clearly tell us otherwise. But aside from that DM intervention, you should be able to push away and pull towards with that single unarmed strike, deciding for yourself, you know what, I'm gonna do open hand technique push first and then gathered swarm movement second. And again, why not? The push away from you comes from your like monkish anime, like massive attack, right? But the movement from your swarm, it comes from a swarm of nature spirits flitting about and moving a creature around wherever you want them to. There's no reason it all has to be away from you. All clear? Okay, good. And thank you to Chris, uh, Triant Monk, for helping me remember that this should work totally fine, rules as written. Right, so we did all of that with our first flurry of blows unarmed strike. We're not done. We still have one more unarmed strike, right? And importantly, as I mentioned earlier, we get to use open hand technique whenever we hit a creature with one of our flurry of blows attacks. We're not limited to one per turn or once per creature or anything. So now that they are conveniently back in front of us, much worse for wear, let's hit them again and push them back through the briar patch. Gorgeous. Now, 
Sure, you are not always going to get to attack an enemy who's standing right on the edge of the spike growth. And sometimes an enemy might fail their save against your initial push, but succeed on the subsequent save to pull them back towards you. And then what do you do? Wade 10 feet into the spike growth to hit them again? Maybe, might be worth it, take a little damage. Maybe you just go find someone else to push instead. As always, I'm going to assume best case scenario here to explore what's possible with the understanding that it's not always gonna work out perfectly every round, every fight, right? But assume Assuming things do line up for us, on our turn we would now be making 4 attacks and ideally pushing them back and forth through 45 feet of spike growth. And that's just freaking amazing. Great that cheese. And yes, I am still going to assume that they're having to walk out on their turn as well. And so, against enemies here with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their strength saving throws, we would on average do 82 damage per round, and against a 16 AC and a plus 6, we would be at 52 DPR. And that's like almost double since last check. Wee wee! We have really come into our own now, creeping into the bottom of tier one compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date. And actually, against those lower AC and plus to save targets, we're beating out everyone but the good old blade singer 2.0 at this level the problem is the damage drops off fairly steeply the higher the ac gets since we don't have advantage and the higher their strength save gets since it's not like they're taking half damage on a save or anything if they make their strength save they just don't move and thus take no thorns damage right regardless this is definitely like the high point of our cheese grater flurry of throws career when compared to other builds we're going to be doing some things to increase our damage going forward but it will start to plateau a little bit by comparison that said hey peaking at around the point that most campaigns end not such a bad thing right okay a level 10 we would be a monk five and that means we get extra attack Ugh, why are we still in monk <laughs> <laughs> I hate getting redundant features, but no, we need Monk 5 because that means we're going to get Stunning Strike. And here's the thing, I almost never build around Stunning Strike because it is so unreliable. Outside of maybe the Fate Weaver build from back in the day, I think I'm out of cards, but this is what the uh, thumbnail looks like. That build was made explicitly to like destroy enemy saving throws so that we could, in that case anyway, more reliably stun lock them, among other things. It was a lot of fun, but yeah, I mean, as great as potentially stunning an enemy until the end of our next turn when we spend a key point and make a melee attack against them is, the enemy gets to make a constitution saving throw to avoid it completely, meaning that when we try to use it, we might just end up wasting one of our very few precious key points, and constitution is generally the worst saving throw for us to be targeting in 5e, right? But here is the thing. When enemies are stunned, not only are they incapacitated and can't move, which is amazing, not only do all attacks against them have advantage, which is amazing, but best and most importantly of all for this build, when they're stunned, they automatically fail dexterity and, yeah, strength saving throws. So this is kind of everything for us, and it might just be the only time I'd ever advise, like, maybe just blowing all of our key to try and stun our target. The problem is, doing so would really hamper our sustained damage, right? And I kind of run into this problem here. Do I start now assuming that we have a burst damage build? That was my original plan when I started creating this character. Character, actually but up until now like I've kind of said we didn't have a lot of like blow all your resources for a big Nova round of damage option so didn't make a lot of sense to call it a Nova build, at least until after level 10. But if I don't call it a Nova build, how do I account for stunning strike in the spreadsheets, if at all? I make some kind of assumption that the enemy has like a percent chance to be stunned, thus increasing our average damage from pushing through spike growth and maybe giving us advantage on those attacks. I honestly, I don't know. It's, it, it's gonna vary so widely, right? In game, I think what we should be doing at this point is trying our best to stun an enemy early in the combat, especially if if they're a high priority target, especially if we think they might not necessarily have a great constitution saving throw. So maybe your spellcasters or your roguish type enemies, right? Maybe begging and pleading someone in our party to use the Bane spell or like getting someone to go Eloquence Bard or Divination Wizard to help ensure that this important stun actually sticks. But if and when it does, we will laugh with glee as our enemy now has no way to resist our cheese grating pushing and pulling. And don't forget, in the current version of 
the game, at least. If you stun a target, they're stunned until the end of your next turn, meaning that next turn, even if you didn't want to blow any more key on trying to keep them stunned, you would still have advantage on your attacks and guaranteed strength save fails so that you could continue to push and pull. As far as how I might account for this in the spreadsheets, I don't think I will. We only have five key points right now, meaning we could only both try to stun once and flurry of blows on the same turn for like two rounds, and that's not very sustainable. Plus the chance of the stun actually sticking is fairly slim if we're only making one attempt, right? Depending on what we're fighting. I just felt like because of the awesome synergy between the stunned condition and the pushing that we're doing, I'd be doing the build a huge disservice by missing out on stunning strike. So make good use of it when you can. Thanks to Tasha's, we also get the focused aim feature at this level, which is kind of okay. It lets us spend more key, up to three key points, to add a plus two to our hit chance for each key point spent, potentially up to plus six, right? When we miss an attack, then possibly turning that miss into a hit. I'm again, not going to assume that we're using this when I crunch numbers, but it might be worth it if you think you almost hit and you really want to connect with that attack to get like a final push into spike growth, finish off an enemy, etc. Also, don't forget, our martial arts die goes up to a d6 now from a d4. Small bump, but we'll take it. At level 11, part of me really wants to stay monk here, primarily to get more key points so that we could be trying to stun more often, among other things. But if we went fighter, we could potentially do even more pushing. So let's do that instead. Yes, for fun. Meaning that yes, we would be a fighter one here and that means we get second win so that we can use a bonus action once per short rest to heal ourselves for D10 boss or fighter level. And then we get a fighting style. And we absolutely want to take the superior technique fighting style as that lets us learn a maneuver from the Battlemaster subclass list and gives us a single superiority die per short rest to spend on it. Though it's only a D6, which is weird. The maneuver we wanna take, Pushing attack, of course. This tells us that when we hit a creature with a weapon attack, and yes, unarmed strikes should count here unless your DM decides to rule otherwise, I know the wording for all of this melee weapon attack, weapon attack stuff in 5e is terrible. They've tried to clarify things with the Sage Advice Compendium and tweets from Jeremy Crawford, but unarmed strikes are considered melee weapon attacks. Feel free to argue about that in the comments if you want, and yes, here's hoping that they clean up the wording in the new player's handbook. Anyways, when we hit them with a weapon attack, we can, you guessed it, add our superiority die to the damage and then push them 15 feet away from us as long as they fail a strength save and they're large or smaller. Unfortunately, this is the first time that we've run into a size restriction on our pushing. Now, using pushing attack isn't really sustainable at the moment. We can only do it once per short rest, but it will be soon enough. At level 12, we would be a fighter two, and that means we get action surge. And yes, it's one of the best features in the game, allowing for some nice burst damage potential, or maybe better yet for us, I think, allowing us to like cast spike growth action surge and start pushing enemies into it right away on round one, which I love. Sustained damage right from round one, no setup round or anything. At least once per short rest, uh, which is when action surge resets, right? At level 13, we would be a fighter three, and that means we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass. And of course, you knew we were going to go battle master because we need more superiority dice so that we can push every turn, right? And now we can, uh, assuming of course that the combat encounter ends by round five which the vast majority of 5e combat encounters at most tables do. So yeah, I'll consider the pushing attack sustainable now because we're gonna get four more superiority dice plus the one that we already have, and we get to learn three more maneuvers. And I'm gonna say, let's go with menacing attack to potentially do some extra damage and frighten our enemies, always nice. Precision attack, which I can see us using, say, on that first flurry of blows attack where we're pushing and pulling right? We really want that one to land. So if we make our attack roll and get a crappy roll, we can, with precision attack, add a superiority die to the attack roll, potentially turning a miss into a hit. And then, yeah, my favorite uh, trip attack, letting us attempt to knock an enemy prone, which would thus give us advantage on our subsequent attacks. If we had more superiority dice, or if we were going for a burst damage build, I'd say we try to use trip attack, right? Get advantage. But of course, if we were going for a burst damage build, I would have said, Let's blow all of our key on our Nova round to try and stun an enemy as well. You guys, in case you couldn't tell, I struggled 
with this build a lot. Um, I went back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> Not unlike the cheese grating that the build itself is doing, right? Um, trying to decide if this was a Nova damage build or a sustained damage build. I had to rework things several times. It really, at least at this point anyways, feels kind of like a sustained damage Nova damage hybrid build. And that's not a bad thing, of course. It just makes it tough to know where to stick it in the spreadsheets. That's what she said. <laughs> But yeah, having some burst damage capabilities is always great. And we have them now with Stunning Strike, Action Surge, all of these superiority dice, and having that flexibility when we need it, that's great. Okay, at level 13, it's time for our next damage report. Since last check, we've added some nice burst damage potential, but as far as sustained damage goes, the big increases are coming from the extra 15 feet of pushing we're doing on what would be that last flurry of blows attack. So. With our action, we attack, attack, then flurry of blows, attack number one to push 15 feet, pull 15 feet, then flurry of blows, attack number two, pushing with open hand technique and adding our pushing attack superiority die there to push them 30 feet deep into spike growth, right? Meaning that on their turn, the closest exit would be 10 feet away now for a total of 70 feet of spike growth damage if they're walking out of it on their turn. But of course, then if they did that, they would be on the back side of the spike growth, probably really far away from you and your friends, likely costing them a turn to get back in combat range if they dash and try and run around, right? So let's not discount the benefit that we get from this build to like action economy, right? And exercising a little bit of control. Anyways, assuming everything goes according to plan for us against enemies with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their strength save, we would on average do 103 damage per round. And against a 17 armor class, class and a plus seven to strength save, it would be 66 DPR. And I mean, you know, we broke the century mark, at least at those lower AC and save bonuses. But while that is a nice bump since last check, it's not quite as big an increase as we saw before, you know, between six and nine. This puts us kind of more in like the middle of tier two compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date. Again, by no means a bad place to be. At level 14, as badly as I'd love to get back to Monk for more key points, I think we'd be crazy not to grab Fighter 4 here first so that we can get that ASI and cap either our Dexterity or our Wisdom, whichever one we didn't cap last time, right? So now we're sitting pretty on a 20 armor class, unarmored, with a really nice DC on all of our important features. But then at level 15, yes, I think we finished the build in Monk, meaning we would be a Monk 6. Now, we could go back to Ranger, and I think the decision on which way to go is mostly going to depend on how many combat encounters you're seeing at your table in a typical day, and how often you're getting short rests. We only have two second level spell slots at the moment, meaning we can only cast spike growth twice per day, right? Now, at my table, it's actually kind of rare that we even have more than two, maybe three combat encounters in a day. If we do have more than two, they tend to be kind of more little skirmishes that are fairly easy to win. You don't have to spend a lot of resources for. I don't know, my DMs just tend to prefer like big epic set piece combat encounters more often than not. And honestly, I kind of enjoy it that way myself as well. Though more frequent smaller fights can be fun too. Anyways, for me, I'd probably go back to Monk here so that we can get more key points primarily so that we can try to stun more often, at least, among other things, but also to pick up some other nice monk features, mostly in the realm of utility and survivability. If, however, you tend to have three or four or more combat encounters per day, especially if most of those tend to be fairly difficult encounters, then yeah, you're probably going to want to go back to ranger here for more spell slots primarily, maybe even before you took fighter levels, right? We'd get to third level spells eventually, and then we could reliably cast spike growth every fight if we needed to. Neither route here is going to have a huge impact on the damage that we're doing. I have to pick one, so I'm gonna assume we'll go back to Monk because, well, they're my favorite class, and like I said, it'd probably make the most sense at my table, but you do what's best for yours. As a Monk 6, then, we get key empowered strikes to make our unarmed strikes magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance. And yes, as always, this is something that you should have gotten to a long time ago if you're often running into non-magical attack resistant enemies and your DM isn't giving you like an Eldritch Claw tattoo or an Insignia of Claws or something, which I really, really hope for your sake that they are doing that, or you're gonna have a hard time keeping up with other weapon using damage dealers. Open hand monks also get wholeness of body here, which unlike in Baldur's Gate 3, take a drink, it's pretty meh 
right? You can use an action to heal yourself for three times your monk level, so 18 hit points at the cost of your action once per day. Hard to imagine using this in combat, and it's not all that necessary outside of combat. So yeah, once in a while, it'll be nice. But hey, we got another key point, and our unarmored movement went up to 15 feet, so that's not nothing, 40 feet of move speed on a dwarf. At level 16, we would be a monk 7, and we get that sweet, sweet evasion, which says that when we have to make a deck save to take half damage on something, like a fireball or whatever, we take no damage if we succeed, and only half if we fail. Very nice. And then we get Stillness of Mind, which lets us use our action to end a charmed or frightened condition on ourselves. That's complicated by the fact that oftentimes when we are frightened or charmed, we don't actually get to choose what to do with our action. So at some tables, the DM will let this feature override whatever is keeping you from using your actions, but at others, it won't, making this feature much worse. But then finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a monk eight, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat. I think I would take resilient constitution here at the very end of the game, and yes, of course, as so much of our damage is actually coming from spike growth, which we need to concentrate on, and we don't don't have proficiency in our constitution saves and thus concentration checks, we probably should have taken this a long time ago. Or perhaps, better yet, started off as a fighter one. It wouldn't have been a bad move at all, especially since we ended up wanting fighter levels eventually anyways. But yeah, I decided to beeline for ranger instead. If you decide to forego fighter at level one, yeah, I probably, if I were playing this character in game, would take this feat sooner. Maybe like after we got dex and wisdom to 18, so that would have been at what, level nine? You decide. But that brings us to our final damage report. And you may have noticed that Aside from capping our wisdom at 20, we didn't really get a lot of things to help us on the damage front since last check. Ah, uh, the perils of post-5 monks in the current version of D&D. However, since we did get a few more key points and we've got 5 superiority dice, you know what? I want to account for the fact that we could very likely have an enemy either stunned or tripped here somehow. Maybe to make it easy on myself, I'm just gonna assume that we've got advantage on our attacks. I know. We won't always, but also, if the enemy is stunned, we'll be benefiting on our damage a lot more than just having advantage on our attacks. We'll be pushing, without a save, over 60 feet of thorns for 60 damage on average. So only assuming that we've got advantage on the attacks feels like I might be underselling the thing. Though, maybe not. Lots of enemies have big bonuses to their constitution saves at this level, right? To say nothing of legendary actions. Ah well. I'm gonna assume advantage and you can be mad at me if you want. <laughs> so, against enemies with an armor class here of 10 and a plus 0 to their strength save, we would on average do 113 damage per round, and against an 18 AC and a plus 8 to their strength save, it would be 81 DPR. And compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date, that puts us in like the middle of tier 3. But. We are disrupting the battlefield, pushing potentially multiple enemies into a damage-dealing, snare-inducing briar patch, potentially throwing down some pretty serious burst damage, stunning enemies, jumping off cliffs, <laughs> catching arrows, doling out some heals and some good berries, and truly living our best martial cheese grater life. All right. Let's bring it on home with some final thoughts. The tier score for this build, if you take the damage that we were doing at every armor class and strength save that we accounted for at each of the four damage reports, just average it all into one big number, we would end up with a 54. And that lands us near the top of tier three, actually. Wait a sec, you kept talking about tier two, even bottom of tier one, what the heck? Yeah, the problem is, because we weren't having reliable advantage, at least until the very end there, the damage that we were doing at high enemy armor classes, and especially at high enemy strength saves, makes the damage really fall off a cliff. for most of the build as the AC and saves go up, right? Which really brings the average way down. And yeah, like I can't emphasize this enough, especially with the spike growth damage, since it's not like they're taking half damage on a save or anything. A save negates any of the damage from the pushing that we're doing, right? But very few enemies have like really high strength saving throws. So all of that said, in hindsight, we might have been better off for going more pushing from fighter and instead focusing on like getting more monk levels, getting more key points to get an enemy stunned more consistently, reliably. I mean, 
As early as level 10, if we did have an enemy stunned, our average damage goes way up. We're talking like a 50% increase to damage on average, thanks to having both advantage on our attacks and more importantly, having the enemy auto fail all of the pushing that we'd be inflicting on them, right? For that reason, yeah. Sure, maybe forgo fighter altogether. Focus on more monk levels so that we can have more key to burn and thus take advantage of stun more often. Wouldn't be a terrible move. Perhaps this middling tier score is more demonstrative of how not particularly helpful my overly simplified tier ranking is, right? <laughs> I mean, we're doing really fantastic at level 9, level 10, again, where most campaigns end. And, I mean, while, sure, strength isn't a great saving throw for us to be targeting, how many enemies are we running into with a plus 10 to their strength save? Not a lot. Way fewer anyways than those that have a 20 armor class, right? But I'm kind of equating those things as the same. So, while the numbers that we came up with, and frankly, that we come up with every week, do serve to give us kind of a general idea of what might be possible with a build, I don't think they paint a particularly accurate picture of the potential with this build especially. In the end, here's the important thing. This build would be a ton of fun to play in-game. I mean, sure, sometimes things aren't going to go your way. Your enemies are going to make their saves, or you're going to miss your attacks, or they're not positioned where you want them to be. But I mean, you can say similar things about almost any D&D build, right? When things do line up for this character, though, it's going to be amazing. You land a stun on your first attack and suddenly you are wailing away for two rounds with impunity, pushing and pulling your enemies. They can't do anything about it. Or maybe you're pushing multiple enemies into the briar patch, right? Like I've talked about, almost like a sheepdog just running around the edges of the area. Hit, push, hit, push, hit, push, hit, push. Get back in there, Bessie. <laughs> I don't know what Bessie is. Bessie a common sheep name? I think that's more of a cow name. Anyways, it would be so awesome. Now, I promised a little breakdown of how this build changes with 1 D&D, assuming the playtest material that we have most recently anyways actually goes live. On the one hand, the build will be even better. I mean, monks get all kinds of buffs, first of all, so just that alone is going to make us better. But then you've got weapon mastery stuff, and aside from that, supposedly we'll be able to unarmed strike as a bonus action, whether we're using flurry of blows or not, without having to take the attack action first. So you could spike growth with your action, and then bonus action punch and push right on round one without even needing action surge, or potentially make attacks to trip them, whether because you're using weapon attacks or because you're using the open hand uh, topple, right? And now you've got advantage on all of your attacks for the rest of the round. Alternatively, the way of the four elements, or warrior of the elements, if they call it that, could be really, really strong here as they can push and pull with every unarmed strike to really just like grate the cheese back and forth, back and forth, right? The biggest potential downside of the new rules, you can only attempt to stunning strike once per round. And while that does come with the benefit of still doing a little necrotic damage if they make their save against it, it means there's a really high chance that we won't be making attacks against a, a stunned target. You know, we can't just blow all of our key to really try and stun them if we need to, right? And so it's less likely that we would have advantage on our attacks and yeah, they're gonna continue to be able to make saves against our pushing that the stun target would just auto fail. In the end though, I do think the build overall is quite a bit stronger with the one D&D rules. Again, assuming that they stay the same as we're currently seeing. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure they'll probably be changed, tweaked a little bit here and there, but I feel confident that monks are gonna be in a much better place when it's all said and done. Regardless, that is the build for the week, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Man, I had a lot of fun with this one, but yeah, got really frustrated by it at times too, like I've said. In the end, I really love that, eventually at least, it ends up being pretty strong as both a sustained and burst damage dealer, and I would love to play this build in game. I hope that I get the chance to do so soon, and I hope that you do as well, but more importantly, I hope that you know how much I love you, because I do. You guys are so awesome. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for this channel. I hope you have a fantastic day and a great week. And if you don't, I really hope you'll hang in there. I hope that you'll do good and be kind and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Bye. Wished I'd have known you, wished I'd have shown you all of the things I was on the inside. 
I'd pretend to be sleeping when you'd come in in the morning to whisper goodbye, go to work in the rain. I don't know why, don't know why. Oh, sometimes the best songs are the sad songs, right? I make fun of Dallin for being emo. <laughs> Oh, Patty Griffin. She's just she's just emo country. But yeah, that that is a beautiful song. And you know what? It's okay. The sad songs sometimes they sort of they can be cathartic, right? They can sort of help us maybe make different choices so that we don't end up like the character in the song, I think. I don't know. It's a rainy day. And I just felt like I wanted to sing a rainy song. Cause everyone's singing, we just wanna be her. Disappearing every day without so much as a word. Somehow. Cutting off Shepard's head. Stop it. Uh. Focus. Come on. You can do it. Ah. Have you guys ever uh, been to Mind Flayer uh, Hypnotherapy? It's a fantastic, fantastic service. Really give you a whole, like a fresh new outlook on life. <laughs> oh, obvious mimic. They're killing it with their t-shirts. Is that? Looks like it might be crooked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good enough. Doobie -doo, doobie doobie doo. Recreate the build yourself without having to... <laughs> There's a plant right here. And that seems to only be... Uh, how do I... That's a tongue twister. Woof! Okay. Mm, where was I? We also... Uh, our AC... Oh, man, it does that. Um, got a little off topic there. Let's see. Go back. To add plus two to, we still have one more blow. All right. <laughs>